Hi guys, Chris from Stoke for Travel here, or welcome back to the channel. Now before I get started, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any video goodness. Now this week I've got something a little bit different for you. Um, I recently went to the Byron Bay uh, screening of the Yin and Yang of Jerry Lopez, uh, presented by Patagonia and directed by the legend that is Stacey Parolda. Uh, if you haven't already seen the movie, um, I think it's coming out on streaming services soon, so make sure you see it. It's an absolutely epic watch. Uh, but one of the awesome things was after the uh, premiere of the movie, uh, Stacey and Jerry actually did a really intimate Q&A with the audience out of the Stone and Wood Brewery, uh, which was a really good insight to the film, the guys themselves, and also the process of making everything and Jerry's life in general. Uh, I filmed the whole thing as well, so this is what we're going to run through this week. Uh, sit back, enjoy, and learn a bit more about Jerry and Stacey. Wow, you guys, thank you so much for coming. You know, it's always such a joy for me to be here in Australia. Um, the first time I came through this area was back in 1970, and um, the waves were, of course, really great, but I think the thing that really touched me was how wonderful the people always were. And every time, every single time I've come, it's just been such a warm welcome. And, you know, in Hawaii we call that aloha, and you guys got a lot of aloha, man. So thank you. I heard that there was some problems when you were starting to create this film. Uh, yeah. We ran into a bit of a production problem when the film began. Um, as you saw from the interviews, we shot on a uh, shaping set. We built a shaping set on the Patagonia campus. And many of you may know that Patagonia is owned by a, a man named Yvonne Chouinard. Well, Yvonne Chouinard loves Jerry, loves surfing, and he wanted to participate and be there with us when we shot the interviews. So he was, and he was there for the week that we shot them. Well, at the end of the week, he went to the president of uh, Patagonia and he said, why are we making this film? He goes, we make environmental films. I don't understand why we're making this film. He goes, I love Jerry and I love surfing, but it's not about the environment. So the producer of Patagonia Films came to me and said, hey, we got a problem. You need to figure out why we're making this film and explain it to the Patagonia people. And I said, why me? And they go, because you're the director. And I said, yep, you hired me. You asked me to make the film. It doesn't make any sense to me. They said, you know, but you, gotta, you have to come up with a reason we're doing this. And she goes, the reason it's important you come up with it is you're going to make the film. They're not going to pull the plug. But if this film doesn't fit into their program, they're not going to support it. And this is how they support it, by bringing us to, you know, having evenings like this. So I went, oh, man, i got to think this out. So I really didn't want to do this. I had to make the film. So I spent a week thinking about this, and I was looking at footage of Jerry doing yoga and making food and, and all these things. And I realized, wait a minute, this is an environmental film. Yes, it's not about the ocean and the mountains and the degradation of things like that, but it's about the inner environment of a human being, someone who for 50 years has carefully tended his inner environment through right diet, meditation, yoga, and right living and exercise. So I presented that back to Patagonia and they went, you know what, that's a really good idea. That fits into our program. We'll back this. And that's what happened, so. And here we are. The other question that I have for you, I'm always fascinated, you've surfed all over the world, I'm sure you've been to Byron Bay many times before, a beautiful bunch of long country. Can you share with us a story about your time here in this town, or this area, something that stands out of significance? Well, like I was saying, we first came to Australia in 1970, they had a world titles, we were staying in the Lorne Hotel, and um, you know, after the contest was over, Rolf Arnest from California had won, and the women's side, a, a gal, a good friend of ours from Hawaii named Sharon Weber had won that part. And then everybody was, you know, going to go back to Hawaii, and I went, oh, we're already down here. This is a big country. Let's 
take a look around. So a uh, great friend that I'd made on that trip, well actually we'd met in Hawaii a couple years earlier, um, but we really became tight on that uh, 1970 trip named Batty Trelore, great surfer, and another friend from Hawaii, um, Jimmy Bleers. The three of us, well, first we went up to Sydney and stayed with Batty's mom right there in Manly, and we had this plan we were working on that, you know, we were gonna drive north, and Batty was gonna show us all the spots, and it was just such a wonderful trip. I've never actually been on anything like that, gone, you know, that kind of distance, and surfed all these new spots in such a short period of time. The first place we stopped was Scott's Head, and there was this perfect right just peeling off. We were the only guys out, except for the dolphins that were surfing right next to us in the waves. And then we spent a, I think about almost a week in Angari, hanging out there with the wilderness guys and, you know, surfing that great wave. And then Batty goes, yeah, we got to come up to Byron because there's really a good wave there. And we came up. The pass was, I don't know, just maybe perfect, slightly overhead, but it was the longest wave Jimmy and I had ever seen or rode. And we get a wave and ride and ride and ride and ride and ride so far that at the end, you know, Patty included us, he goes, yeah, just get out and walk back. And it was about a 20 minute walk back to get to the lineup. And we couldn't believe that there were be a wave that you could ride that long and we just, you know, loved it. So you guys live in a great area. How I'm many, envious. How many people were out back then? <laughs> a handful. So jealous. Um, at the end of the film you had said that you feel like you're at the teacher phase of your life. So what do you believe is gonna be the biggest lesson that you leave behind? The biggest lesson? The greatest lesson. Oh boy, I would have to say that we all need to keep paddling. <laughs> Not only on our surfboards, but in a metaphorical sense as well, because uh, that's the only way we're going to get anywhere. And yeah, that's what I need to do too. But you know, surfing, I think. We, all of us here, have the great good fortune of being born in this lifetime to this role of being water people, you know, whether we're surfers or just walking on the beach and being able to be close to the ocean, be a part of the ocean, and be able to learn a lot of things from the ocean. You know, you learn that the waves of life are actually the toughest ones to ride. And eventually you learn how to ride them, and I think that's the reason we're here. Jerry, um, your life has been one accolade after another, and I'm sure you're, uh, you're getting used to this. <laughs> but um, I just wonder if you realize um, how much impact you've had, I'm sure you do to a point, but how much impact you've had on so many different genres around surfing and around the lifestyle that we lead. You know, uh, that movie just blew me away and for someone as old as me, not quite as old as you, but to have experienced, to see all those images and all those experiences and I, I kind of feel bad for the youth that haven't experienced some of these things. It's a unique generation that we live through, and I just want you and Stacy and Jack and everybody else involved to just get a round of applause for what what you presented to the surfing community. It's it's just remarkable. Wow. Well. You know, I think that all of us have been, again, real fortunate to live through this whole
period of, of what I like to call modern surfing. And it's really been so much that's happened in this lifetime of ours. Uh, I mean, all of us have seen, you know, how much surfing has grown, how much it means not only to us, but to so many people and, and new people all the time. And we're just really, really lucky that, that we get to do this thing because I think it's really a good thing and, uh, you know, it's much more than just having fun. Um, it teaches us a great deal that we get to take these lessons back to the beach and really live our lives better. And I think that's important. I'd like to add something to this. One of the difficulties of making this film is Jerry's aware that he's lived this life, as you say, you know, that he's had these accolades, that he's done these things. Um, but he doesn't think about them a lot. And I had to excavate his life and then present it back to him and go, what do you think about this? And he'd look and go, oh, right, I, we did that? Or I did that, do you think that's important? He's so busy, still at this age, living his life for the next thing and still so focused that he's aware of what's behind him, but he doesn't think about it a lot. And so I just wanted to add that little bit of that, that he's just, when you're around him, he is so focused on what he wants to do right now, and he has a lot of stuff he wants to do right now. <laughs> Still, he's so intense about learning new things. We learned to kiteboard together, and I saw his process. He, one day we were kiteboarding, and it was a perfect, beautiful day, great wind, and he sacrificed the entire day to learn what's called a down loop. And he fell every 10 minutes, blew the entire session learning this trick, which he never learned. I mean, you may know it now, but you didn't get it that day. But I saw this and I went, wow, that guy, he's dedicated. So yeah, that's what he was really saying was, man, that guy's dumb. <laughs> ask you this question. As a snowboarder that recently, um, in the last 10 years, started surfing, I've always wanted to ask you what you found in snowboarding that maybe you didn't find in surfing and what um, yeah, transitioned you to the mountains. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> the snow. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Hawaii. I never saw snow. I never knew what it was. And you know, it's just this wonder. I mean, the snowflakes, geez, everyone's an individual. And, you know, you get those stellar days where the snowflakes land on your sleeve and you look at each one and, you know, it's like psychedelic. And then riding the snow was so much like surfing that I thought, I am surfing, just in a different way. And, you know, Stacy and I talked about this whole lifetime that we've enjoyed here. And all of us have seen so many things that have come out of surfing. Skateboarding started with surfers, windsurfing, snowboarding, you know, stand up paddle, kiteboarding, all these things were all sports that originated out of surfing and they just kind of resonated with me that as a different way to surf and that's really what I felt like when I went to the mountains I was surfing the mountain and in one way it was kind of interesting because the mountain would hold still for you while you rode it you know, and I think back, wow, well, the you know, ocean never does that. <laughs> and then I thought a little more and went, yeah, that's why surfing becomes such a great metaphor for life, you know, because if you don't move with it, man, life just passes you right by. So you got to keep paddling. Um, so I think this is for both of you, but um, I just felt that was really 
sort of inspiring. And I just wanted to sort of say, like, I feel like I get caught up in the busyness and like perceived opportunity and, sorry, perceived opportunity. So like, it's very hard for me to slow down and enjoy the moment and, you know, really be in it because I'm like, oh shit, you know, what's around the corner? Maybe I could be doing better. Maybe I could be, you know, like earning more money or doing this better or performing more or being better at this. And I feel like I'm kind of like living life a little bit in the resistance. So I guess it's like, I see you guys, you kind of like, no, I don't want to be a movie star, fuck that, I want to go surfing. And it's, it's a big thing to turn away from all the money and the fame and all that sort of stuff and, and just be like, that's okay because there's better things coming. So I guess what's your advice for somebody who wants to just be a bit more that way? Are you, like, you know, when you think about music channeling like Van Halen? And if that's the case, then maybe dial it down to, like, Joni Mitchell. <laughs> you know, not to be facetious, but, yeah. We all have to, you know, take those moments, step back, slow down, smell the roses. And life does go by really fast, and you know, before you know it, it's past. And you gotta, you know, set that intention that life is moment to moment, but to live each of those moments to its fullest potential. And when you have that intention, even though you miss a few moments here and there, you're gonna enjoy life a lot better, I promise. But I think it's a practical exercise. I can tell you from observing him, he does it by doing yoga, which slows him down, and he puts a tremendous amount of effort into it every day. For myself, I do meditation. I think as, as, a, as humans, we're moving too fast, and I don't think it's healthy for us, and it certainly isn't healthy for the planet. I think if we just need to slow down. We're just moving too fast. We need to be more still because if you look at nature, nature's still. It doesn't move much. It doesn't need to move much. Or the crazy's moving too much. So, slow down. Joni Mitchell. I'm gonna start this. I just would like to share something with you because I've spent so much time observing him and observing these sports. I honestly think that we are living through one of the most remarkable times in human history. And what I mean by that is in our lifetime, us here, we have lived through the shortboard revolution, skateboard revolution, snowboard revolution, BMX revolution, and then all of the revolutions within it. Let's just take surfing in general. Surfing, longboard, shortboard, uh, windsurfing, kite surfing, now foil surfing, now wind foiling, kite foiling, paddle foiling. I think in 200 years, people are gonna look back on this time, this 50 year period and go, wow, what a remarkable time that must have been to be alive when all those sports got invented because they weren't even here 50 years ago. And we have been the beneficiaries of this. We have been able to learn these things and give birth to these things. We're here right now doing it. Remarkable, it's a remarkable time and I honestly think that this is the, the action sports equivalent of the Age of Enlightenment. It really is. I mean, it's, they're gonna look back and go, wow, those guys got to be alive at that time. That's what I feel. And you know, one of the reasons that surfing, well, has become so popular and so crowded is because of the surfboards. I mean, all of you, especially us old guys, you know, remember how terrible the surfboards were when we started and how great they are today. And that just makes it so much easier and so much more fun to go surfing. And I guess, you know, more than any other thing, it seems like that surfing has really, really benefited from 
some of the technology that uh, comes from up here. I, I want to add one and, thing. Oh, yeah. oh. I want to add one thing. We, you know, we toured the film in Europe, and two of our biggest screens or you know, showings were in London and Berlin. These are cities not even near the beach, and we were blown away with how many people showed up to these screens. And in, in Berlin, I asked the audience, "How many of you surf?" Then eighty percent rose their hand, ra raised their hands, and I went, "Do you river surf? No. Do you uh, wave pools? No. They go to the beach." And that trip, I realized. The world knows this now. They figured out surfing. They know what we've known all this time. I think the whole world knows now the secret. How fun this is. <laughs> it's not just us on the coast anymore. I know, Germany doesn't even have any beaches. <laughs> like, has always stuck with you to, to keep the spark alive. Um, and whether it be the rocker or bottom contours or um, or fins or something like that, um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think as a surfer shaper, and I know there's a, quite a few of them here in the audience tonight. Every time you ride the board that you have, you're thinking about how you could make it better and. You know, there was a point in time where, back in the late 60s, when everybody only had one surfboard. And you rode it, and you rode it in all the waves, whether they were big or small, whether it was sunset or pipeline. And you rode it until you hated it or it broke in half. And then you went and you made a new one. And each time you made a new one, you were trying to improve on the last one. And there was a period of a couple of years there where nobody knew exactly what these new short surfboards were supposed to look like. And there was just, you know, massive experimentation and just trying to find something that worked. And there was really a lot of duds. <laughs> but it's, you know, this constant process of evolution in surfing that I think goes back to the ancient Hawaiians that, you know, the first step, well, the first thing is you go surfing the first time, you go, wow, okay, I want to do this more. And the first big step in the surfing experience is getting your own surfboard and you learn how to ride that board, and it compels you to get better at riding it and learn how to ride it and you know, become a better surfer, and that progresses to a point. To go beyond that point, you need a better surfboard. And when you're making them yourself, that's the whole goal, is to try and make a better surfboard, you know, so you can surf better. And it's not easy, and when I started making snowboards, I had a brief career, I thought I wanted to get in the snowboard business. Um, I thought a snowboard was just an incredibly technological piece of equipment. And then when I really found out how they made them, I went, oh man. This is like making a sandwich. A surfboard is, has so much more technology in it, in the shape, you know, in the construction, and everything. And it's just been this, what Stacy was saying, this wonderful age, this time where all of us have got to, the older ones especially, have got to see the surfboards evolve from these planks, basically, that, you know, really didn't ride very well to the modern surfboard today that really makes surfing a lot easier and a lot more fun. After hearing you talk, you've got a great deal of admiration for Jerry here, like a lot of us in the room do. I was paid to. Uh, well, not damn, nice, nice man. Good gig. <laughs> not enough. Great gig, great gig. Hey, um, how early did that start for you? Like, you know, 
Were you and Jay and Tony influenced by images you were seeing of Jerry back in the 70s? Like, did that affect the way you guys approach skateboarding? And do we have Jerry by proxy to thank for the birth of skateboarding in some respect? Or like, at what point were you sort of seeing this guy on the ways and going, holy shit, like, I want to do that too? That's why we rode skateboards. We were actually, we, want, we were surfers first, okay? And we wanted to be professional surfers. We started competing in surfing. And so when we rode skateboards back then, we didn't even call ourselves skateboarders because there was no such thing as skateboarding back then, okay? It didn't exist. So when we skateboarded, in our minds, we were surfing. And in Los Angeles, we had these school playgrounds that were built on uneven land. And so they had to make bank walls around the playgrounds that were black asphalt and there were these beautiful black asphalt waves, okay? And we named all of them. One was Waimea, one was Pipeline, one was Sunset. When I was riding Pipeline, I was Jerry, okay? When I was riding Sunset, I was one of three people, Reno Aguilera, uh, Barry Kanayapuni, or um, Terry Fitzgerald, okay? And everything we did with our bodies was emulating surfing and we did this because First, it felt great to do, but secondly, we thought it would improve our surfing. Where Jerry picked yoga to help his surfing, we picked skateboarding. And that's what we were doing. We never had any idea that skateboarding was gonna come along and take us away. We had no idea. We were trying to be you know, uh, professional surfers. That's what we wanted to do. Like, you know how you have those magical times, like the sun setting, and you can kind of remember those five best surfs you've ever had, or 10 best surfs you've ever had. Um, yeah, even if you just have to make it up. <laughs> the best session was always the last one. <laughs> My memory never stretched much further than that. You know, I was always so focused on what I was doing as I was riding a wave that a lot of times I'd finish a wave and I'd think, what happened on that wave? And I wasn't able to remember it. And I was going, God, am I an idiot or what? And I finally figured out that I was just so into the moment that, that the mind, the intellect, you know, had ceased to function. And it was like that, you know, they call it a Zen mind. Well, the Zen mind is one that's blank. <laughs> and you're not using that lower mind, that intellect. You were trying to get into your upper mind, the, the higher mind, the intuitive mind. And when you did that, then you never remembered what happened. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I really never thought that much about remembering when the best session was, except, you know, the last one that I could remember, which was usually yesterday. <laughs> Thank you guys all so very much. Thank you. And there you have it guys, a little bit of insight into the Q&A from Jerry and Stacey at the screening of the yin and yang of Jerry Lopez. Uh, like I said before, it should be coming out on streaming services soon. You can learn more about the movie on the link in the description below right over at the Patagonia website. That's it for this week guys, make sure you like, comment, subscribe and I'll see you next week.